lot of times I'm driving, there's nothing to do. And I shuffle through the radio before I unglue. There's a lot of red on ways, it's traffic, I'm screwed. And I'm wired a bit different than a regular dude. It's not a bad thing, I embrace it, it's true. The radio don't stimulate brain chemistry fluid. The Buddha found nirvana and the four noble truths. Through a meditative process, right action he proved. For me, I require the use of a tool, a detector, pin, pointer, shovel, and beach scoop. I'm meant to work the dirt with my history crew, but everywhere I look, my interest taboo. Most people choose Bieber over Tippy Canoe. What does a detectorist listen to when the radio is full of bad music and news? I need an alternative for me to peruse. Beyond sight and sound gets fantastic reviews. A metal detecting show where my thought bubble brews. Thank you, Josh Kimmel, for inviting me to a detecting dork out with guests like yours, true. Lee? Are you looking for a high quality beach and sand scoop? Are you trying to take your hunting to the extreme? How about an American based company that stands behind their product? and everything they sell. Then check out our friends over at Extreme Scoops. John has been making scoops for some time now and makes a quality beach and sand scoop to take your hunting to the next level. Extreme Scoops recently released their new sand shredder that works great in the water and on the beach. And if you're a new Equinox user, you may want to check out his Surfmaster X3 that can trap those small targets you new Equinox users are finding out there. Extreme Scoop's company approach is let's do it right. So do it right, buy it once, and go to the extreme. ExtremeScoops.com That's X-T-R-E-M-E Scoops.com Caution. Please do not operate motor vehicles or power equipment while under the influence of this show. Listening to this show could cause side effects such as bouts of laughter, violent binges of cabin fever, and even dreams of silver and gold. Please be advised. Now that the fine print is out of the way, on with the show. All right, the fine print's out of the way. It's time to roll with the show. We're back. We're live. We're here. Wednesdays, Sundays, 8 p.m. Eastern, always 8 p.m. Eastern. Why? Well, that's that's just, that's when we throw the switch around here. Oh, let's see here. Uh... <laughs> Looks like everybody's all fired up in the chat again already. Jesse's in. Welcome aboard, buddy. Been doing a lot of work on that room. It's looking good, though. It's looking real good. Definitely. So we got the bills in. We got Crazy Spider, Chuck, Jesse, Nelson, uh, Eddie, Tam, uh, Good grief, I don't know, something happened with my chat here, and everybody's way, way ahead of me. Uh, I'm falling behind here. Mike Foreman in the chat. Awesome, welcome aboard. Uh, obviously, for those that were listening Sunday, Mike was the winner of our 1,000 likes contest the American Silver Eagle, and he was a live listener, so he got a nice prize pack sent out to him, a bonus prize pack, basically, a mystery box, you could say, and that, well, on my end, that shows that it was delivered today. So not only is it there already, it showed up a day early. 
according to when I shipped it anyhow, because it, it was saying ETA was something like Thursday, but then according to the information, it uh, it arrived today. So hopefully Mike has checked that out and it has come in. Hopefully he will uh, post up about it. Congratulations to him once again. Dave D. in the house. Paul. Nice, nice, nice. Ah. <laughs> Happy Nurse's Day to Barb. Hmm. Well. <clears throat> so uh Mike has been on on quite the uh the winning streak you could say definitely I don't know let's see he he had won a snake skin recently off of the show and I believe he put that on his simplex I want to say uh Oh, let's see here. Yeah. Mike says that he had a rough day at work, but he came home to a box full of goodies. So, good to hear. Nice to hear that it did arrive okay. But yeah, he uh, he won the snakeskin. <clears throat> one of the snakeskins that was recently given away on the show here, courtesy of Shooters and Prospectors. And he won the Silver Eagle in the Thousand Likes giveaway, which was his first Silver Eagle. Very, very nice coin. Very nice coin. Those things are just phenomenal. Great to look at. Uh, he won the, the bonus mystery box of items, so he got a box full of goodies. And he did. It, it was a box full. Um, and then I want to say... I think Sunday we were talking that uh, he may have won the the Nocta digging tool from Detect America uh, here recently too. I don't know. I'm not sure that that would be kind of odd. I guess. Uh, Casey's in. Welcome aboard. That would be kind of odd though. If the prize pack that we sent out to him beat the digging tool there from Detect America, although we know that shipping has been hit and miss, hit and miss. Uh, I know that that parts for the ugly boxes are starting to come through. They're back into production with that and doing very, very, very well. Uh, they, they've been assembled and, and going along with that. So the dealers should have those back in stock here very, very soon. I, I know Sunday, I want to say, Chuck said he still had one in stock if people were looking for them. And I'm sure he'll be restocking those soon. They are a very, very popular item. Uh, you just, you can't beat them. They work great. They work great. Definitely. So, links in the description, obviously. First and foremost, our friends over at Shooters and Prospectors, Extreme Scoops, DetectEast.com, The Ring Finders, XP Team USA, The I&I &I Group, uh, Crazy Spider Adventures on YouTube, Detect Ed Outdoors on YouTube, Ohio Metal Detecting on YouTube, Metal Detecting NYC on YouTube, a lot of good YouTube channels there. And you can find XP Team USA on YouTube as well, just Google XP Team USA. Uh, the links for the Electrolysis Boot Camp. Yes, we do still carry them because they were very, very good videos. Good information, definitely. And videos that everyone should watch. Especially if they're thinking, you know, if you've not messed with electrolysis before, maybe you're a little unsure of it, a little confused about it, uneasy, anything like that. 
definitely go watch the videos and get yourself into some electrolysis. Get your cook on. Whether you're using the ugly box, whether you're using your own, do it properly, do it safely. You won't damage the item and thankfully along the way you won't damage yourself either as long as you're doing it properly and safely. So that's always something to keep in mind. Definitely. We have dropped the link for the uh, East Coast Research and Discovery Association beach hunt. Their hunt was canceled, uh, unfortunately. Unfortunately. <coughs> but that's what we've been seeing with a lot of events this year already. And it does seem to continue. Does seem to be be uh, continuing. But along with that, we're we're still having fun with the shows and everything. And it's great to see that some people are getting out. They're still making some. Well, quite frankly, they're making some killer finds. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. Get onto Facebook. Take your pick a group, and it's right there. Great finds. Matter of fact, today Chuck was out and got himself a nice, nice looking Mercury dime. Not bad at all. The other day he got himself a, uh, a barber dime. That thing was only just a couple inches deep. I don't know, maybe maybe two inches deep in the gravel. I I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, what sort of condition that came out since it was uh, since it was in the gravel. <laughs> Dyslexic typing. Okay. <laughs> oh. That's all right though. And Chuck says it was just a short hunt, but hey, he was he was having fun now. He was having fun. Uh <laughs> I I feel the struggle, Chuck. Uh my my phone doesn't like to cooperate with me either when I'm on some of these uh go lives uh or even in the other shows chats. That's why people don't see me comment very often. They they may not even realize I'm there. Uh because a lot of times I may not be putting a lot of a lot of activity into the chat due to technical difficulties you could say with the phone or or more the uh the ID10 port basically the the little interface between the user and the phone my my fingers just they don't want to either my fingers don't want to cooperate or the phone doesn't want to cooperate with my fingers I'm not sure which but we'll see we'll we'll figure it out we'll figure it out we we're working on things you know trying trying to get going the right direction that's all I can say Either way, I think we've got the links out of the way. We've got Strikers links in there too, I believe. And we did drop the uh, the beach hunt there in Ocean City since it has been canceled. And you never know. We may see more links uh, going falling to the wayside at some point. Uh, I don't know how many times I've said it. Obviously, we work with those that work with the show. We like to see the reciprocation. We try to keep the reciprocation going. Uh, and it's a good thing. I mean, there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with cross-promotion and networking and all of that. And I see... Mike's in the chat as well. Welcome aboard. Uh, recently, 
I want to say our medical awareness show, I believe it was, we gave away a Morgan Silver Dollar courtesy of Mike and uh, Metal Detecting Central Illinois. If you have not checked out their group, go ahead and check them out as well. A lot of great posts and contests going on over there. <coughs> uh, and I, I want to say, yeah, Bill had won that. And he should, I I would think he should be seeing that by the end of the week. Uh, obviously, he he's... He knows what's going on with it. He's been kept informed of the situation, and, and we certainly appreciate everything that Mike does with the contests that he does over there on the group and all of that. Definitely some very, very good stuff. Very good stuff. And just like we appreciate everything that uh, Chuck does as well. Always keeping people on their toes. And likewise, we try to do what we can to... to Keep him on his toes, you could say. He's been staying busy. It's good. Very good. Okay, so let's see. Obviously, what what did we title that? Uh, okay, I've got my detector. Now what? Starting the hobby off right. And I really, I don't know. I hate to uh I hate to sound like I'm kind of taking a soapbox. But you know how a lot of times you you guys and gals, many many of the people listening to the show right now, they're regular listeners, they've been following the show for a while. Uh let's see. Looks like maybe we've yeah, we do have a caller. All right. Go ahead. Oh, it's Chuck. Go ahead, Chuck. How's it going? It's going very well, and it, it's kind of funny that you threw that up there. Or you got their detector, or they made a choice in the detector. What do I do next? <laughs> in this past week, I've had several, and through the weekend, brand new to the hobby, call and ask, and we talk about budgets and things like that, and what kind of shovels and, <laughs> you know, what kind of detector, a couple of them. And, and, and you know, and, I'm not trying to them into a high dollar unit that's going to scare the heck out of them. No, absolutely not. You're going to steer them into what is going to work well for them in their situation, but fits right. their budget. And that's what a good, reputable dealer should do. And so I've been working with a group of them. Actually, I had five, six this past weekend get equipment, and five of the six are brand new to the hobby. And and it's kind of uh, very coincidental, you could say, then, because you and I have not talked about this. You had no idea that this was coming up tonight. No, I didn't. No, <laughs> no, I looked at it. Up. Well, that's coincidental because uh, a gentleman that was here today has been using a borrowed detector and working with a few other people and learning a little bit. And he made a decision, of course, budgetary what he felt he could handle, things like that. He picked up a <clears throat> lesh tool. He wanted a good solid tool to dig with. Good. He uh good pinpointer, things like that. And he came up and we gave him some demonstrations and he picked up a simplex. And uh he thinks he's gonna go right after it. He's already been detected. He understands that part of it, but two of them had never had a detector in their hands. And we gave them demonstrations of several different units, and ORX was one of them, uh, Equinox, Simplex, and a Garrett. <clears throat> and it's been a mixed group. Uh, 600 went out, a uh, couple Simplexes, and the one guy was just died in the wall, walked in the door. This is what my buddy said I should buy, and he bought an Ace 400. Well, I... I guess uh, hopefully his buddy steered him right. Then uh, I mean, and and that's the, the whole thing. Group he hunts with, the whole group he hunts with seemed to be Garrett. So oh, so it stands to reason with, he's uh, gonna, the whole. Uh, yeah, it yeah. stands to reason he's going to get a Garrett then. Mm-hmm. 
And, and it's and, hard to steer them away from it, showing them other things. And I did do a couple, and he said, I know that one, I know that one, but this is what I want. And when they're when they're dug in like that... There's no use in fighting it. Right. As as long as they've already made up your their mind before they contact you, there there's probably not much talking them out of it or anything like that. But you know that that's one of the reasons why I put in there reputable dealers because that's kind of part of the dealer's job. If if they come to you with no idea at all other than hey I want to get into the hobby, then as a uh, as a professional, reputable dealer, you want to steer them in the right direction. And, yeah, and uh, the one kid is with a group of Garrett hunters, and he decided he wanted a My Lab Equinox 600, and we set him up with it, got him going with it, and and he's down back home, and he sent me a picture this afternoon. He got a seated corner in about an hour of hunting. <laughs> nice. Got a rebel out there then. Yep, and he uh, said that the uh, Garrett guys were all talking to themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's funny how that happens. I mean, we get out there, we're hunting Just in a group. Of course, and, and, you know, I've had other first-day users score some pretty nice stuff with various detectors so uh, <laughs> you know yeah you just you <laughs> got to be fortunate enough to get your coil over it and sometimes i mean right. some people say it's newcomer luck or whatever and and sometimes i think they're finding these great finds like that right out of the gate because they're just starting to learn their machine and they're digging everything and they haven't uh I don't know, for lack of a better term, become jaded in the hobby. Correct. So that's great and, to see them doing that. And I've had others that have bought the machine, and I'll contact them back, and they say, yeah, I found a silver dime, or I found this and that. They don't say much. So it's just the way it goes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And it, this time of the year, it, it always seems to be around this time. The weather's getting nice and we see an influx of either newcomers or, or people that have been out of the hobby for a number of years coming back. And it happens every year. We see this cycle. And I've seen this week on at least three different groups on Facebook where somebody will come into a group and the first thing they'll post is, hey, thanks for letting me into the group. I just got a detector. I'm looking for any tips or tricks to to get me going or uh, to point me in the direction of where I should go detect. Nobody wants to research. Yeah, they 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 really want... I got to turn this down. Hang on a second. I had to walk upstairs. Um <clears throat> We don't have any feedback, <laughs> but uh, uh, it it just amazes me that uh, I've had several others do the same thing. Brand new detector walk out the door and just score something big, and I said, "Well, <laughs> that ain't going to happen every day." But congratulations, and you got any questions? And my goal has always been, just like we've talked, when we get somebody in the hobby to steer them into what they want as far as budgetary needs, give them some training, back them up all the way down the road. I mean, stay right there if they need help and they have questions and and steer them to the right people if I can't answer that question and, and keep them going and build it up. And I've got some longtime friends out of the deal. It's, it's pretty cool. Right, and return customers, I'm sure, because it's that mm -hmm. after-the-sale customer service that keeps them coming back. Right. <clears throat> the 
and and we see this too on Facebook groups too, where where people are like, "Hey, I I want to get into the hobby. I want to buy a machine. What should I buy?" And you'll see everybody always wants to mention what they're using, and and nobody wants to stop and check and see. Well, what is your budget, or what environment are you hunting in? And it's kind of the same way with these people coming into the hobby, especially the the newcomers. Where they get their machine and they're like, okay, I've got my detector. Now what do I do? Uh, right. X YouTube channel inspired me to get into the hobby. Okay, well, if you were watching this YouTube channel so religiously, for lack of a better term, haven't you picked up any pointers from them other than well, I want to find what they find, so I'm going to buy the machine that they use, and and then I'm automatically going to go out and find this stuff, too. It doesn't work like that. <clears throat> and Right. I'm reading something from Earl, and he's 100% right on this. There's, there, there's not that many that get into the hobby that have researched any exactly. place to go. And they just start out digging, and, and they, they want to learn. And you find a lot of stuff. You find, a, and he's right, nails. We all find a lot of nails. <laughs> right. And jar lids and all kinds of different things. Maybe even and, some frustration. Um, right. Dodd says the second hole we ever dug was a two real. Yeah. yeah. He, uh, he was definitely spoiled, but uh, I mean, he does his research and and he goes out and he hits the ground and he makes some killer finds. Mm -hmm. He does, and I've seen where I don't know if you've seen this in in your area or not, but I know I've ran it across. I've ran across it here a few times where people don't take into account with their budget. I may need a pen pointer. Well, you should have right. one. I I should probably have oh, a pouch. Big tool. Um, I should probably if have a with my lab or S. Get the Andy Savage book. Exactly. I should probably uh, have a proper digging tool. They because... talk to the correct people, or or whoever may have a book out there that, that sometimes you can't talk to everybody when you're out detecting. The, a reference point, a reference book is always good to have if it comes, if it, if it's out there for that particular brand and model, no matter who wrote it, um, something to go by. Right. Or get into a, uh, a Facebook group in your area, try to find a local club, some local hunters or something like that, where hopefully, and, and in many cases, we, we are usually pretty good about that, where we try to teach them our good habits and not our bad traits. And maybe they'll take you under the wing and and kind of show you the ropes, so to speak, because I know of a, a few instances around here where people have gotten a detector, <clears throat> never had one before, they just get it, and the first thing they do is grab a full-on garden shovel and head for your local beach or park. And right. that's the wrong way. To get into the hobby. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, when the first time I ever detected, I did not own a detector. I was using a gentleman's detector, and this is all the way up in the Boundary Waters area. This is Lake of the Woods, Minnesota, Oak Island. There was an old homestead on there, and the gentleman was from Iowa, and he had a white gold master. This thing was huge, and it was right, heavy. That was an arm breaker, and, yeah. Good machine in the day. And though. we were out. I took him back. He, he knew the homestead was there, didn't know how to get there. I got him back there, and he let me work with it. And I'm hunting along the edge of a barn. The first find I ever dug is a 1903 Winchester rifle. The first... See now, there you go. That That's the first thing I've ever dug. 
Now, what a way to get started right out of the gate like that. It was brushing up like pretty Tom. heavy and, you know, non-functioning at that point. But Doesn't still, matter. that still just cool. locked me in right there thinking, wow. And, of course, he, I get, he's got the rifle. Okay. But I was learning. He was just showing me something. I get this long signal, and I, he had a, a shovel, and... I rolled it up, and there's a rifle barrel sticking out, so I started pulling it out, pulled it out of the ground, and I held it up, and I said, holy smokes. And we were looking at it, and, you know, of course, it was his detector. I gave it to him, but it was pretty rusted up, but it was the neatest find that you'd ever want to do. The wood was in rough condition, but Obviously. it was still fine. Yeah. yeah. So uh, now but, were you thinking, wow, this is my first target. I'm going to go out and do this every day. Well, I didn't get, that was back in 71. And, uh, I was working for a, uh, flying service up on the boundary waters and we were flying all over up in the, what they call the shield lakes area. And he had cabins there. And I was working for him and learning to fly. And, uh, my time was very limited, very few days off, and it, what a dream job when you're working a summer, going to college, and working for a flying service, learning to fly, and this guy wanted me to take him back. Harry asked me to take him back and Swede, so I took him back there, and we spent the day back there, bottles, God, we found old bottles, and... Um, then the following year, I decided to research. And, and you know, at the time, you got a magazine, and you look for dealers listed in the magazine. Exactly. And I found a gentleman down near Carthage, Illinois, that sold white metal detectors. I drove down there and bought, a, I called him. He basically showed me how to put the batteries in, how to kind of set it up. We went out, ran over some stuff. That was it. Didn't have a pen pointer. He didn't nope. sell you dig tools. He showed me what to do with a screwdriver, the old screwdriver, long one, round the end, go carefully probing, and look for coins. And it took about the very first summer where I did it, it took, before I found something I really, we found wheat pennies all the time, and silver a lot, <clears throat> mugs, oh, yeah. things like that. But I I found anything old that was two months into it, and I'd done a lot, two and a half months. I found a, and I still have it, I think it's a 1903 V-nickel. Nice. That's what I considered my first old find and started understanding depth and watching the meter and tying everything together. That came together on it, and, you know, but... People look at you when you tell them you went out hunting, you were in Davenport, Iowa, down along the old fairgrounds area in the parking area, and you dug bottle caps and all kinds of stuff. But it wasn't unusual to have a day where I dug 35, 40 silver coins in a day. Yeah, absolutely. Those That was kind of the uh, golden age of detecting, so to speak. I mean... If if we come home with a few silver coins now, we've had a good day. But back then, it wasn't nothing for you guys to come home with what we do in clad, but you're bringing it home in silver. Yeah, we brought a lot of silver home. And the clad was out, and you were finding clad laying on the ground. Um, the first half I ever found was a walker, and that was over in uh, Cabinport, and literally in that particular area it just banged this thing and I almost walked from it and so I got down and pinpointed with the detector as tight as you could you got real good at pinpointing so you could probe it and that rounded screwdriver hit like a quarter inch underground and here's a 47 walker wow phenomenal in one and a half inch deep if that Right. You just never know so, sometimes. Hey, with the pinpointers and the technology and the connectivity and books and in large clubs and groups on Facebook and teaching, uh, you get too many cooks into the making the 
stew, you know, and people get confused. So you try to steer them the right way and listen to reputable people. There are people that know Mind Lab and Garrett and Das and these type of people are our resources and the books that are out there and things like that to help them get going. But it's still worth the time to take them out in the field for a few hours and teach them. Exactly. Uh, and <clears throat> that's what we see. I mean, many of the listeners in the chat, yourself included, I mean, we're, we're all good ambassadors of the hobby. And <clears throat> right. there's a lot of good YouTube channels out there that will oh my god people will learn they they just have to go and take the time to watch and listen right experience is is 75% you got to get out and and listen and start working with your machine and seeing what it's going to do for you and understanding and learning the proper setups the other 25% before you go out the door and then the rest is getting in the field and experiencing what's going on and tips and tricks will come up, um, watching everybody online and YouTube videos is perfect, but the actual experience out in the field is, is way ahead of that. Oh yeah. And <clears throat> for, for some of the listeners, maybe they won't recognize the name, but I, I believe, uh, Jimmy Sierra was one of them that, you know, he was big on, you know, it's it's 90% research, 10% in the field. Right. You've got to do your research. And right. the, uh, the people I've seen posting lately on Facebook of, oh, I just got my detector, now what do I do? Uh, a couple of them I've posted and said, here, search through the Beyond Sight and Sound archives, listen, you'll find topics that, pique your interest you will learn check youtube mm -hmm. and then there's been a few of them too that i tell them you're the the first question they're asking is okay i got my detector now where do i go to hunt go to your backyard start in your own yard right. the the, there's yard. no <clears throat> there's no better way to start to learn that machine and not only are you learning the machine you're learning how to cut a proper plug and recover a target properly before you go out into the public eye because our our actions don't just affect us. It affects the hobby as a whole. So when you've got somebody out there with a full-on garden shovel digging in a park, that kind of gives us all a black eye. Yep. I had a gentleman buy a detector from me quite a few years ago. And um, I carried Fisher and Compass and Whites at that time. And he called me up, and I drove over to Atkinson, Illinois. And they built a new subdivision. And he said, well, where should we go? I said, let's just go do your yard. And I said, we'll, we'll find stuff there. Well, this house isn't but three years old. I said, that's Doesn't all right. There'll, there'll be something. It doesn't matter. And the second target, I'm showing him how to run it. I got this target. It's an Indian head painting. Huh. And then we, and I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought anything about this. A little further, we got a barber dime. We got a barber quarter. This is in this yard of this three-year-old home. I looked at him. I said, um, it's right on the outside edge of town. I said, was there a home here, do you know, before this was? I don't know. So I did a little research. The subdivision sat on the old fairground. Oh. That was used for a couple, two, three years in a park on the one corner. And he bought the machine, and then he's calling me up, telling me what he found. Come on back over. And every yard out there, that was three, four-year-old homes. There was stuff coming up that was phenomenal. Now, I'm talking in the seeds, and right. it's like, oh, my God, I had no idea it was there. He had no idea it was there, really, And uh, but I found an old Atkinson map. Yep, you're on the fairground. Well, and, and that's the thing. Some of these sites we get into, sometimes the mm -hmm. we, we think it's one thing, and then the finds that we start to uncover lead us to 
do more research and we find that it's something else, and and many times we may wind up being pleasantly surprised, like you were talking about with the housing division, we've got an area here where a lot of people, they don't even realize, because now it is a, a subdivision, but when you look at the old maps, a fair portion of that subdivision covers an old amusement park. Oh boy. <laughs> right. And and it's it's tough to get permission on some of those homes, but if you know the layout of the old amusement park, where that stood as far as property boundaries, there are areas that you can still get into that is public land. And when you get onto those areas, I mean, you're you're pulling up Mercury Dimes, you're pulling up Standing Liberty Quarters, and when you couple no. that with the history that's layered below that because of just the general area of the 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 general area history what went on there before it was an amusement park like you said with the house that was three years old what was here before that well there was a fairground so okay well what was there before that was there anything there before that so you see that history in layers and here you'll go out to this spot that looks like an average ordinary park or spot and all of a sudden you're finding standing liberties, you're finding uh, mercury dimes, you're finding Indian head pennies and wheat pennies. And then all of a sudden you, you stumble across maybe a seeded coin or uh, a mid-1800s, late-1800s ring or or even buttons, things of that nature, where for you, some you of come the people with all kinds of stuff, but we gotta be careful on talking about what we're finding now. I see the house just fell down because Pacific goes in. Yeah, I see Steve's in there. Welcome aboard. <laughs> yeah, Barb putting out. Yeah, gonna gonna have to gonna have to watch that because he may show up on your doorstep. <laughs> That's right. You never know. <laughs> right. Uh, the way I understand from what I listen to from those guys, he'll show up if Frank brings him. Well, then it's a good possibility he may be in Illinois then next year. Some, some trip in Florida or something that I heard about. Yeah, yeah. The, it was it was a tough trip for him. Uh, I I <laughs> guess from what I understand, uh, past conversations and everything, I guess Steve got. Uh, pretty pretty terribly sick on the way back. I don't know if it was something he ate or or a bug he got or if it was just sick of Frank or what. But he he got <laughs> he says he can't sneak in anywhere. Nope, no he he can't. Uh, he's well, you know he's he's a pretty pretty well known guy. He's easy easily spotted. <laughs> Okay, Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot. What was the first memorable find that you made? Type it up in here. What was the best thing that you found early? Not not years later, but right off the bat, what was your best find? Anybody else wants to right. put it up there, too? Let's, let's see what your first finds were. And the pizza uh, place 100 yards Todd, from the beach doesn't count. That's right. Todd... Todd put up that he got a real, and he just asked permission on a house, no prior research, and he's learned how to research just like the rest of us have. Right, and and we do. We we find out the the longer that we're in the hobby, the asset that research can be. Research can be quite a an advantage of a tool in a toolbox. Uh, some people they they don't put a lot of weight in it, but you can learn so much from research. Well, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's let's uh, Eddie. He found an eighteen karat woman's band at my local. Nice. Uh, Looks like Steve says his was a ring. Uh, Ohio Wild Hunter Kennedy half Indian head penny for Bill. 92S Barber Time from Elusive. Mike Lockwell Matt found a money clip. Talking about 
a gold ring, a mercury dimes, barb, a penny. Second hole was a silver ring. That's cool. Mike's was a, I'll bet Mike found a money clip, and I'll bet there wasn't any money in it. V nickel <laughs> for Tam. That, that, that's the first old coin I found. That's cool. Yeah, she yeah, actually she got two of them on last John, year. John Standing Liberty, Mike Foreman, first three months. Great way to start. Well, Ed, Ed, 1893 Barber Dime. And you always remember those first finds. I, I, sw- I swear, I can, I, I can still see that V-nickel coming up. It was about four inches deep, and I looked at it, and I flipped it over, and I, wow. You know, yeah. and it'd been it had been a while. And after Versus all the rifle that I came across up north. And after all these years, you can probably walk right back to that spot and get within ten feet probably and be able to point at the ground and say it was right in this area. Yep. They Eddie uh, says the gold ring made him save up. It made him save up so he could probably buy a better one. <laughs> and then Steve says his best friends are platinum wedding set with lots of diamonds, that's cool. Hey, there ain't nothing wrong with ice. Eddie moved into the good good side there. He got himself an E-track. They are a silver hunting son of a gun. Yes, they are. Ed says he can't remember what he found 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that, too. Right. Yeah, no. well, there's some of us that can't remember what we found four days ago, let alone 40 years. Now, for the guys that started in that time period that far back was there any help out there for you or did you just order a detector and go out and figure it out on your own in yeah, today's that's... comparisons you know you've got all these great people out there that'll help you i mean we've got we've got an expert on from uh Deus XP team. We got uh, Dave D on here. Was I don't know if he's we still got on few. here. We got a lot of people that are in there for a long period of time. We got a few. They're willing to help Todd, you. Connecticut Todd knows yeah, this. Deus CTX Todd. Equinox. You got it. Uh, Mike, he he knows bounty hunters inside now. He does. So Steve, he's well. Steve's Maybe good he with knows them inside. No. Steve's good with the knocks. He's got a few detectors. Yes, he's been. Yeah, I know he's had a lot, and he and, and him and Frank get together messing with other stuff. And Frank likes to he he just likes to try different detectors. Oh yeah, yeah. But he he usually tries to make sure that he puts his time in with them as well. Uh, and he's been working with a vanquish on the beach. And it's kind of interesting hearing about that because, you know, our beaches here are not salt. They're fresh water, and the water's just dropping. I haven't really got a beach hunt now for about two years. And uh, spot on says a white dealer ray and good friend at the hardware store in northern Wisconsin. There you go. What year was that, spot on? Type that up. Did you have the old blue box style, or had they changed? Right, those those were some... Social networking, Steve, yeah. How long have you been detecting, Steve? Well, and, and, that's, and that's the thing, too. I mean, like like you were saying, we we have so many resources at our disposal today because of the technology that we have. We've, we've got the the podcasts and the go-lives and YouTube and, and Facebook and... All these different resources that we're able to reach out and communicate with one another and talk a little bit of shop, trade some tips and tricks, or if somebody's struggling with a machine, they're able to reach out to someone else that uses that machine, and, you know, hopefully the person kind of gets them steered in the right direction. I mean, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Did I? Ed? Got a Coin Master 4, that's what I started with, early 70s. Todd got in in 1998. I mean, Scotty, 84. Yeah. Definitely. Man, there there are some, uh, there's some people in here tonight that they're a little long in the tooth. Oh, yeah, it sounds like a White's Coin Master Burgundy, 1995. 
Oh, yeah. And been a had, while since I've seen one of them. Yeah. And first white machine Ohio relic hunter owned. He went to change the batteries and found a sandwich, jug of milk, and the pickle jar in it. Yeah, they were big. Yeah. They were they were tough. Yeah. They yeah, were you, tough. Could, you you just about needed they a, had a uh, You just about needed a semi trailer to haul the batteries around for them things. Barb had an Ace three fifty, she's laughing. Steve says he started with no, a bounty hunter. No. These all have come up through this, and you understand where we're at. So if you got somebody new, you know, and I know you do, we take the time to help them. And uh, that's pretty cool. Right. I mean, that that's about all we can do. I mean, because, uh, well, like like you were saying, good example, uh, when mm-hmm. when I got into the hobby, there there wasn't a lot of activity on forums and stuff there there were some so i did have that bit of advantage over say when you got into the hobby and and we had the the magazines but that was about it i mean to find a local hunter they were they were kind of like hen's teeth. You you were really surprised if you ran across them. You, oh my God, there are other people out here that do this. I'd say in his his first machine, my lab sovereign. Steve hunted with Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble, um, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So, but that my lab sovereign is still widely used and loved. They dropped making that, but I'll tell you what, those people who had sovereigns, you can't pry that out of their hands. Well, and, and that's the same way with like the, uh, you know, the Fisher 1280s and, and some of their, their models. Uh, when you see them pop up on the used market, a lot of times they go just about as quick as they show up. People yeah. know what those and machines Hayes, are capable his first of. Actor was a Walco. Boy, that's that's one that I haven't seen for a while. I've seen the name, but I haven't seen one for a long time. I wonder if that was the Trailblazer. I mean, th- those. He that's... said it was a Tearsman. Oh, okay, okay. No, I don't see anyone though saying anything that they started with a Heath kit. And uh, we have had some guests on the show that they have started back far enough that that's that's what they had were either the Heath kits or the Realcos. If I yeah the Realco, if I'm not mistaken, Don Finch built a Heath kit. Yes, if he, I remember he right, he did. Two, that was his first one. Then he got a military mine sweeper. Yeah, which, there again, I mean, the advancements in technology and everything, can you imagine trying to swing one of them back in the day? No. <laughs> no, I saw them. I, right. I never ran those old ones, but I've seen them. And, uh, it, uh, you know, see how far we've come to what we have today. I mean, we've got a computer on a stick now. And, uh, yeah, and that's, that's another reason why we do need to utilize those resources that are available to us. Yep. Yep. Be safe, John White. Anyway, it, it's, we're, we're fortunate, but now it's gotten to the point that these units, the advanced, what we call advanced units, are kind of overwhelming for some people to start with. So it's, yeah, it's a big yeah. learning. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the reasons that, that makes it even more pertinent that we reach out to other people and use those resources, not only reach out to them, but find reputable people to gain that information from, no matter how we gain it, whether it's from YouTube or from listening to us here or Detect America or or whatever, you know, pick your poison, but at least pick it uh, sensibly. And, and the network of dealers has grown rather large over the years 
but then some fall off, don't make the grade, whatever. So I, I keep saying you go to your reputable dealers. You do too. Um, the one guy told me that Mike's group recommended to come to me instead of going on Amazon, and he he got he got his detector. And, oh, um, good! I remember that post. Yeah. I I can't remember the gentleman's name right offhand, but I know who you're talking about because I was in conversation with him. So was Mike. Deus Paul puts up Deus is an overwhelming machine. Yes, it is. It can it, be. It, it it can be, and uh, so that's where you reach out to guys like uh, Dave D and uh, some of the others that can maybe help you and direct you further. I use Deus, but I don't use it every day. I've got certain machines I tend to go to quite often, the little 800 by 3030. Um, I've been working with the Simplex quite often. I'm trying to get astute with several others and, uh, you know, and, and stay to where I can get them going and then help them reach out to whoever they need to or take boot camps or go to trainings, things like that. Uh, but I've, expanded throughout the country uh yep andy's book does help a lot of people bill orh and uh that kind of stuff uh the mind lab series uh is something i really work with a lot in the 3030 and i worked a lot i actually traveled the country for mind lab training other dealers how to use it they had me in classes they had about 10 of us in class so we could train other people, and then they sent me around the country going to other dealerships, training dealers how to use them. Right, yeah. So everybody has a few that they, they're a, a real good at, but as it expands more and more and we get wider ranges and switching from one to another to another to another trying to show people, sometimes gets a little overwhelming in its own right. Right, that's that's what I was just going to say. I mean, it's it's you definitely want to spend time with your machine and get to learn your machine to utilize that machine to its fullest potential. But then some of us out there, yourself, Frank, Steve, many of us, we're, we're spending time with multiple machines to see what they can do and to be able to help mm -hmm. others. And sometimes that can throw you for a little bit of a loop, too, because you're you're having sometimes you may have to refamiliarize yourself with the navigation of the menu or the VDI ranges and things like that, and that can bring in a whole other ball of wax. That's a can. Oh yeah, yes, it yeah, can. and and it's tough because they're they're just they're coming left and right anymore. There's a lot of great units out there. Yes, there is. The war is on, and we're winning because we are. They're all trying to pack so much into a mid-range unit or a little less expensive unit that brought more masses into the detecting world again. So more people are out there, and uh, it's it's pretty cool. So. Uh, but then there are the ones that no matter what you do, they're, they're going to buy one. They're going to go out and, and work on it to, that, that on their own. And they'll either get fed up with the hobby and that detector sits in a closet and they don't use it. They, they still run into that. Right. Turns and won't reach out else to help them. <clears throat> right. And that's that's kind of what I was saying, you know, for for a lot of us and and seeing what people have posted in the chat, too. There wasn't necessarily anybody to learn from. We we had to kind of learn the ropes ourselves. And that's right. now with the newcomers coming in, there are a lot of advantages because they don't have to learn the ropes on their own. All they got to do is reach out and ask somebody, and many of us are more than willing to try and help do what we can, even if it's just something as simple. I mean, I've had people out where it's 
the simple little things that they may not pick up on right away, like how to detune your pen pointer when you're zeroing in on your target. Things like that, that obviously, uh, like you had mentioned, we I remember the days before pen pointers came along, and we had to use the, uh, the screwdrivers. So the pen pointers were a real game changer. And the newcomers yeah. coming uh, into the hobby, they don't realize how much that spoiled us, how much time that can save us. And some people, they just go, hey, I, I want to get into the hobby. I need a detector, and that's all I need. Uh, no, you may want to rethink that. And I'm sure right. you've had that experience back in the day where you're using the screwdriver to probe, and you go ahead and put a nice gouge across the good target. I have a 19, I have a 1922 wheat penny, wheat D, and it's got a scratch right down the back. Ouch. And that was found about 30 years ago. That's Ouch. about a 90 to $100 penny in dug conditional or better. Right now it's just a filler because there's a scratch right across the back. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> and unfortunately, many of us, we have to learn that lesson. I mean, we didn't have any other option at that point, really. But now we do have those options. We and have an option, and I try to steer them into the pinpointers and stuff. And oh, I don't, really, Connor says I picked up a lot of closet queens cheap. Oh yeah. In other words, he's been in a lot of good detectors that got stuck in a closet, hardly ever used, if any at all, because they got fed up with digging junk and not finding anything decent because they didn't know their machine or learn the machine. Right. They're sitting. They're hiding in a closet. Yep, they did. Hopefully they took the batteries it. out. I've seen some of them that were in the closet for way too long, and the batteries just ate the daylights out of them. Yep, they they didn't understand it. They didn't put enough time with it. The frustration set in, and next thing you know, right. there's another person that now they're they're no longer interested in the hobby or or think it's a waste of time or something like that. But it can actually be a extremely rewarding hobby in many ways, more than just monetarily, uh, if you just give it a chance. That's right. Just getting out and being, you know, a group of guys and doing a little research and getting some permission on old fields, old homestead sites, so on and so forth is a hoot. And <clears throat> like Frank in Darwin, they spend days down at the Historical Society. I'll go down for a few days, but I have a lot of research books here on the Mississippi River and landings and things that I follow closely and try to get on to and other guys and now you don't have to go exactly to these places but there's stuff at those there are still gyms sites. that you will you find. find online yeah there are still gyms that you will yeah. find in those areas because they're not available online yep so it, but uh you know go out like todd was saying go out and do some research that's how you're going to find some of that stuff i i working on a site now on another steamboat landing and I just obtained permission a couple of days ago to get on this site and uh, I'm going to be working on that those landings they, they it, it, there's one not far from me about seven eight miles where they boarded and offloaded people along with goods and they had a regular structure there different things like that I've seen pictures of it and I'd hunted that one and literally, yeah, it's been good on what I found there. And you won't see many pictures of that because <laughs> I'm the only one that's got permission on it. And it's been real good. So that's the kind of stuff I like to come across. Yeah, absolutely. And and that is kind of the, the other, the flip side of the coin, so to speak. Some of these places that you can get into like that, you may not want to post up photos because other hunters that may not have the the couth intact or, or uh, character, maybe they don't want to do their research. They just want to stalk you. And Mike Lockermit. Oh, go ahead. And we've seen that right. before in the hobby, where that's they'll just drive around and follow you and try to figure out where you are. 
or where yep. Bill is or, or whoever. So you have to be careful about that too. Uh, you said Mike had said what? Mike, Mike was making a point there. Knowledge of my machine has been my saving grace. And you're right. Take a machine and learn it. Right. Learn it inside and out. And, you know, like I tell my customers, I am not an expert because I'm always finding people finding other things out about these machines. A lot of my customers give me feedback that I learn from. Right, and, ways uh, to tweak and, it. And that still goes down. And I don't care if uh, they class themselves as the expert of this machine. Somebody's going to know something more that will help you. Exactly. And that's the other part of it, too, is we all bring something to the table. I mean, even even the newcomers that are coming into the hobby, some of them do have some very interesting ways of looking at things where maybe we learn something from them going, you know, I never thought about it that way, but that might be a good spot to check out. Yep. So that's always yep. one to keep in mind, too. Definitely. But you're and and Mike's right. I mean, knowledge is king, whether it's in the research or in your machine. The detectors all do what they're designed to do. They're all going to find metal. Yes, some of them will do it better than others. Some of them will find it deeper than others and things like that. But as long as you spend the time with your machine and you get to know it, that's when you unlock the true potential of the performance of that particular machine, whether it's a bounty hunter or an Equinox or a Deus or a Simplex. Take your pick. Great. And so when people are starting out in in going to that dealer, that dealer should have a good working knowledge of the machine to get them going well and then knowledge enough to tell them you're going to need ABC book. Here's a place where you can go learn. Here's a guy you can talk to online. And there's others locally here that I can put you with that would be glad to help you because I don't always have the time to meet up with everybody. Exactly. And I want them here. And this is what I tell my customers. I want you to succeed. I don't want that thing sitting in a corner or sitting in a closet. I want you out there using it and sending me pictures of some great finds. And that's what I tell them. Right, because if they're succeeding, they're happy with their purchase, they're happy with the choice that you helped them to make as a dealer, and in that respect, you've done your job flawlessly. That's right. And that's... that's right. And Mike just made another post. The best machine is yet to be made. Well, you could probably say that. Maybe it's the Apex that's coming out on the 15th. You never know. <laughs> right. We'll just have to wait and see because they're still pretty good at keeping that under wraps. But right, they're uh, keeping that tight. That's the best jobs on that I've seen. Oh yeah, they're they're doing real good with the hype on that one. And and the research <laughs> the research also falls into, you know, if you're getting into the hobby and you're not sure who to deal with, ask some people on Facebook that that have been around for a while that can steer you to a reputable dealer because I've seen dealers that that they will post I have carried brand X for 5 years I've sold this line of machine and seeing what you people have posted with machines that you have bought off of me have finally inspired me to try one myself that does not give me any faith in that dealer, if you're carrying a line of machine that you're selling to people, telling them that it's such a great machine when you've never even used it yourself. Hang on, I might have to leave her. I heard that. Yeah. Nope, I don't. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, I was paying attention to what that came up telling me. Um, so... I'm going to I'm going to back out. I do have to make a call here. So um, uh, you guys have a great night. But I got to take care of some business here. So um, be safe out there. Sorry about that, Josh. I'm going to back out quickly here. I don't have to make a run, but I got to make <laughs> sure a run gets safe. That's right. You got to keep everybody in check. They they're keeping you on your toes. That's right. Well, All hopefully right. they stay safe. Have a good we'll, night, we'll folks. We'll see you. Thanks for the call, Chuck. 
Uh, bye bye. But yeah, you you've got to find your reputable, and and I can't stress that enough. Your reputable dealers. If you see a dealer saying, you know, I carry this brand and have for years, and I've sold them for years, but I can't provide you after the sale customer service because I'm not familiar in any way, shape, or form with that machine or that brand, that should automatically throw a red flag up for you as a newcomer coming into the hobby. <clears throat> don't deal with the big box stores. Don't deal with the big box online retailers like Amazon, for lack of a better term, because you may not get that after the serve, after the sale customer service. You're going to get that. And that's a guarantee. You find a good, reputable dealer, whether they're local or whether they're at a distance. Like we, we mentioned Chuck here on the show. That's, that's our dealer of choice. And for me, I'm, I'm here in Ohio. He's out in Illinois, but you can still provide that good after the sale customer service, even over the phone. So I don't look for a local dealer. Uh, realistically, there aren't many local dealers around here anyway. But some of you, maybe there are reputable local dealers right nearby or or not very far away. Uh, Todd, for example. I mean, when, when he got his first machine, when he got that Sovereign, he went down, he got that Sovereign from Gary Storm. That was, uh, you could say, his local dealer at the time. And he was a reputable dealer. He He got him set up with everything that he needed. You know, uh... Or, or John says in the chat, Striker's been good to me, uh, and and absolutely, you know, I've I've messaged with John, I've talked with Striker, you know, Striker gets him set up, he makes sure that he's, uh, you know, making an informed purchase, you could say, based on what he sees online, what what he knows, personal experience with the machines. Maybe he asks Stryker, Stryker gives his opinion. Well, hey, you know, uh, it, you, here's the detector that will probably work for you in, in your situation that meets your budget or your environment, your style of hunting. Uh, have you thought, do you need a pinpointer? You're going to need a digging tool, a pouch. That's what a reputable dealer will do. And those are are like gold to us as end users out in the field. When you find a good one, you stick with them. And we we have to watch as these newcomers come into the hobby. We've said before, you you've got to understand your local laws and regulations. If you're traveling somewhere to, to try and do some detecting, hook up with one of the locals. Reach out to somebody ahead of time. See if, if you can get together with them. Because if it's an area you're not familiar with, it only stands to reason that... Uh, oh, let's see here. Looks like we've got a... I think I got a man. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, call her. Good evening. Well, how is it going, Mr. Mike? It's been going great. I've really enjoyed this show. It's been wonderful. Well, it's, uh, like I said, I hate to sound like I'm getting on my soapbox or something, but it is a topic that does need to be addressed from time to time. And in the last week, I've seen people making posts similar to this, on at least three different Facebook groups. And I know I can't be seeing all of them. So there's a lot of people out there that they're just 
they're they're not giving it any thought and they're automatically hey i got my machine now where should i go tell me that and right it's right. not that simple i mean you you can't just jump in and go right out and you know uh i just got my detector today i'm going to walk right out and i'm going to find me a big old gold ring with diamonds on it it just it doesn't normally <laughs> work like that no, it doesn't. The uh, the rare people who walk out and find something really great when they're, in their first hunt, like uh, I know I've re- I've seen people post that they found a silver dollar the first time out, or a silver half, or a, a standing liberty quarter. You know, these are really great, great first time finds. They're a great find any time though. Absolutely, because they're they're very they're uncommon. Right, yeah, they they don't necessarily pop up every time we go out. I think the first thing I dug up was a cable TV cable. Ooh, <laughs> it was one I had uh, I had patched up for a friend and helped lay down, but uh, I I thought it was a, a pretty long thing to be anything of interest. But I checked it, and it, it was a cable, and I thought, which I thought it was was when I when I was digging it. But I wanted to be certain. Right. I, it was my it was my first hunt, <clears throat> and uh, I, I was digging. I was taking notes actually. I took notes of what I dug, how deep it was, the signal I got, uh, what the readings were on my display, and my settings. Uh, I was very methodical my first three hunts, uh, taking, uh, exacting notes. That well, I am, you seem to be, approach. yeah, you seem to be very methodical, period. <laughs> yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that didn't stop after the third hunt. <laughs> no, I, I, I really, one of the things I recommend new people to do is, Maintain a hunting journal. Right. The the location, the dates, uh, what they were hunting with, how long they hunted. That's great for uh, 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 keeping track of the battery life of your equipment. Right. Even Uh, the uh, time of day or the soil conditions or weather conditions. All, you know, anything of interest. People you meet. That's That's something that... Uh, as an interesting addition to my uh, uh, hunting journals that I go back and look at. The first time I meet another detectorist out in the field, uh, you know, this is, that's uh, one of the great treasures of metal detecting is all the people you meet. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would have to agree. And at least with the journals, like you said, you can go back and, and you know, go back through them uh to to reminisce or even to remind yourself about certain things i uh i mean i like to tell people my mind's like a steel trap i've i've got a lot of information in it unfortunately some day it'll get to the point where it doesn't let any of that out <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, probably too true but I'd, I'd rather not think about it uh, but, right. uh, my, but my attitude is when I go out, if if it's not a place I've researched, uh, I go out and to enjoy myself. And I know I, usually the worst that happens is I get fresh air, exercise, and I leave the environment cleaner than I found it. Yeah, and I, I mean, really, I'm not seeing a downside here. <laughs> it's uh, uh, I know I. I Counting uh, about a hundred pounds of trash I picked up off the surface from first year, I had about three hundred fifty pounds of trash I recycled. Exactly, and and there are a number of us that, when you stop and think about it, people don't realize those of us out there that are bringing it home and recycling it, how much we're actually accruing. Uh, due to the fact of letting it pile up and then take it into the recycler or or however you want to do it, 
Not only are you keeping the environment cleaner than you found it, you're getting the trash out of the way for the next time that you're there, and maybe you're getting enough that you're paying for your fuel, or your lunches, or the batteries for your machine, or even your machine from the trash. Yeah, make no mistake about it. When you're pulling out heavy metals from the soil, you're removing potentially uh, poisonous uh, substances that can and get hazardous. into the water, uh, and right that can get into the water table and uh, into our drinking water. Right. So that's and you know the the plant life appreciates it too usually. Uh, well, and depending on where you're at, so do the other people, whether they realize it or not. Uh, say, like you're picking up used hypodermics or nails that are sticking out in a tot lot, uh, bottle caps with broken pieces of glass from the bottle still attached to it that that people, you know, small kids or people could, could step on or fall on or whatever and injure themselves. Yeah, I found... Uh... Three hypodermics near bus stops or schools. Right. Uh, from tot, tot lots, I pulled rusty razor blades. Mm, pocket uh, knives. Plaster screws. Those are really sharp. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, rusty nails, like you said. Those. But I found some neat stuff, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely you will. You've got to be willing to work through the trash to get to the goodies. Got to dig the trash to find the treasure, right? Exactly. Because when, like, if I'm out hunting, a lot of times I just love to hear the iron in the area then. Because I know I'm in a good spot. You you may, because iron leads the way to occupation and activity. You may wind up digging a lot of trash. But if you slow down and you get methodical in those areas, usually you can be well rewarded for your efforts. And I've seen some newcomers come into the hobby. They get into an area like that and and they'll hang in there for 10, 15, maybe even 20 minutes. And all of a sudden they go off to a, a cleaner environment because they just they haven't acclimated to that sort of environment yet. But people don't realize that will when when you get into an environment like that and you spend the time that will make you a more resourceful and more successful hunter in the long run in the i have a small lot that i've hunted uh it used to have a small warehouse over it before that it had been other businesses and back in the late 1800s it had actually been a homestead there uh, it's one of the trashiest places I have ever hunted. It's not just the bits of iron, like rusty nails, but it's aluminum. It's from, everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's absolutely everything. And I use it, I call it my training ground. And yep. I, I have found, I found my only trine at that lot. It was about six or seven inches down and I dug three square nails out of that hole before I I could get to it. So it, I mean, when you dug a, dig a plug in that uh, lot, your pinpointer is almost useless because it picks up, you know, like a half a dozen other pieces of metal. Right. And when you do cut that plug, don't leave it until there's not a signal there. That's, uh... Very wise words. I mean, I I can tell I I got out onto a spot one time where you you could tell you could hear the iron there, but you could hear something chirping through that iron. And when I cut the plug, the first three targets out of the hole were nails, and then out pops an 1893 San Francisco mint barber half. And oh then, my. And then out pops a few more nails. Well, essentially, by the time everything was said and done, I had six or eight square nails in my pouch that had been surrounding on top of or below that barber half. 
but I got that barber half. Yeah, that was a that was a great effort on your part uh, and a great find. I'm not I'm getting green with envy thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's that's like, that's one bad thing about the the social media. It, it it can kind of make some of us green with envy and a lot of times, you know, I I like to say, "Oh, you guys are killing me out there," but really it's it's uh it's all in your perspective. I mean, that's what I say, but I'm happy for them. And many times it inspires and motivates me to try and get out and find that stuff too. Yeah. I, I turn a, a particular shade called Indian green. Oh, I love <laughs> it when they come out that nice emerald green color. You definitely can't uh -oh. beat it. Well, thanks, Ohio. He just welcomed me to the Trime Club. <laughs> well, and hey. and Man. and that's a guy right there too. I mean, I've had this conversation with him. When you can find a site like that, a trashy site like that, and you put the time into it, and you see, yes, okay, I am finding trash, but I am finding other targets too. And then after spending an amount of time in that location, whether it's a week, two weeks, six months, whatever, and you look back on it as to what your methodology of hunting was going into that site originally and what it is after spending time there has changed your hunting style and tactics and you have become a more methodical and successful hunter by putting that time in. Exactly. I, I am, I was, tr when I'm on that site, I tr am training myself very, uh, very specifically. Uh, I'm right. using an 11 inch coil and I'm hunting in uh, nearly all metal mode at full sensitivity. And that is a real challenge. Yes, it can be for some people. Uh, it certainly was just about drove me nuts for when I first decided to take that approach. Cause oh, absolutely. It's it's not for everybody. I mean, some people you hear they go in like that, and 10 minutes in, the first thing they want to do is wrap their detector around a tree. I... Uh, and then there are days when I cannot handle that myself. It's just too much. There's too many, uh, too much sound in my headphones. Exactly. Uh, if I'm feeling kind of headachy or, or tired. And I notice when I'm tired, when I get tired or especially I get tired from pain in my, in my knees. Exactly. And I'm not, I'm not hunting to my full capacity yet. Uh, uh, of experience at that time because you're I, absolutely I'm, right because it's you find it harder to focus on the task at hand so you're you're not as sharp and and you're well so to speak slipping in your game exactly you and you're not yeah you're just not as sympathetical with your machine or your environment and it, it does have it does it is telling it is telling. Absolutely it is. <clears throat> and especially for those that have been out there doing this for a while, we can tell when we're off our game. And and we know, hey, you know, it's whatever, the head's just not in it today. And and maybe we still go through the motions and everything, and, and we plug through, and maybe we still uh, bring a good end to the day. But then there's other days where we know, yeah, this it, it just it ain't gonna work today. It ain't happening. Yeah, and in my rougher days, I find myself intentionally digging trash just as a, a reality check to check myself to see that I'm perceiving things properly, that my machine is perceiving things as I perceive, as I interpret it. Uh, and I, those, those are things that I notice 
about my own hunting. Right. And I'm sure that many of us find ourselves doing that actually, you know, whether it's, uh, we're out there and we're, we're, we're hearing the signals, seeing the VDIs or the depth or whatever and trying to uh, call the target before we recover it just to see if, if we're still okay or are we on our game or aren't we? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I seldom, uh, get involved with the discussions on, uh, but with uh, new people asking about what machine do you recommend, you know, for starting out. But I do, I do hate uh, someone coming up and saying, "Okay, what should I do, use as an introductory machine?" And someone coming up saying, "Oh, you should get an uh, an ATX Max or, or uh, you know a CT." I mean. A, you know, like an AT Pro or or even someone who's it doesn't matter how much money they say their budget is. I may say it's a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. There's always somebody who's going to say, Oh, you need to get this, you need to get that, and it's a thousand dollar machine. Right. Or somebody you says use my this budget's machine. a thousand or someone says it's a budget's a thousand dollars, they say, Well get us uh C T X thirty thirty, you know, which is over twice their budget. You know, and, and I had someone say, well, that's not that much more. Go ahead and get a CTX-33. Well, I said, you know, that might not be that much more to you, but for a lot of people, that is. Right. For some people, that could be a world of difference, and that could be the uh, the deciding factor, whether they stay in the hobby or never get into it to begin with. Exactly. So, it it the, the best thing you could do is recommend they get a detector in their hands to try to see if the hobby is actually for them well and that's one of the things that that's kind of my pet peeve too when people post and say hey i want to get into the hobby what machine should i get and that's usually how the posts go and then everybody just automatically starts throwing out well you should buy this machine because that's what i use and and i find this stuff and nobody even stops to ask them, well, what area of the country are you located in? What is your budget? What environment are you going to be hunting in? What type of hunting would you like to do? Nobody wants to find out the logic behind it or anything. They just want to automatically start throwing out machines before they even know what their budget is. And, and it's hard to recommend a machine because it's so subjective it's like going out to buy a car you know because there are there are well there are just uh aesthetic things to consider too not just the functionality of the machine because a lot there are a lot of good machines out there they'll do the job as you discussed earlier but for instance uh i don't care for the a series i like the garrett name and i like the way they back their products I don't like the color. I don't like loud colors. I'm, I want a, a, something that doesn't draw attention to me because I do a lot of urban hunting. Right. And I, I, I want to have a low profile when I'm out hunting and draw as little attention to myself as I can for being out metal detecting. Uh, right. The other thing is I don't like the tones. Uh, I have a buddy that was using an ACE detector, and he refused to use headphones. And I had to keep at least 200 feet away from the guy <laughs> because uh, it was uh, it was disturbing my hunting, uh, hearing his uh, hearing the tones. Uh, those are some of the things that are very subjective, and you don't know until you see until a detector. You try, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, what? That's just like what, and and that's one of the bad things about questions like that because what works for one person in their situation or environment may not work for you in in yours. And for some of these people that are throwing out, you know, oh yeah, you should get uh, a CTX thirty thirty. Which don't get me wrong, it is a great machine. I've got one. I, I've made nice finds with it and everything else. But maybe that's not the machine for that particular person. 
maybe their their machine that they really click with because some of these people they will click with certain machines maybe for them it's it's a, a MindLab Equinox or or maybe it's the Nokia Macro Simplex or maybe it's the Bounty Hunter you just you never know and when you throw a question like that out in a group unfortunately that's what you get is everyone's personal opinion and not necessarily what may be in that person's best interests another subjective factor and a physical limitation for some is the weight of their machine you know how how easy is it for them to swing in the swing for a long period of time. Exactly. I mean, and for, you don't, for you don't me, know that until you, yeah, you don't know that until you actually hold the machine in your hands and actually try it because of the design of the machine affects how, affects the swing and the weight. Right, the ergonomics of it. You know, the size of the coil. Uh, yeah, yeah, but that's where having a trusted and reliable dealer really comes in handy. Right. Or reaching out to, to another person in the hobby that's knowledgeable in maybe a few different machines or can at least steer you to a reputable, knowledgeable dealer. That's why it's good to join a good site, uh, a good club, meet people, uh, like-minded people, people who have experience in the hobby already and you know, aren't necessarily, I, I know, a lot, like with automobiles, the, the car analogy, people get brand specific. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm identified with Bounty Hunter, but I am not brand specific because I will consider other brands because I know... From a technical standpoint, there are better detectors out there. There are detectors that are maybe they they, they don't find things any deeper than what I what I find already, but they have different types of uh, mode, different modes right. of better discrimination di or better di target separation, or 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 better aftermarket accessories or. Uh, maybe it's, maybe it's built sturdier. Uh, maybe it's, uh, and maybe it's just the overall bells and whistles. Or maybe it's easier to use. You know, you don't know until you have the experience. And that's another reason I don't, you know, jump into conversations about detectors because most of the people that discuss detectors will talk about all the highfalutin, high end detectors which i have limited experience with so I well and, and you're right there there are a lot of people out there that they would rather go brand specific when realistically in the end of it all the important thing is to get you into the hobby and get you into the hobby the right way learning our good ethics and character traits and not our bad habits and find the machine that works for you. Because it, in the end of it all, at the end of the day, there could be 20 of us out there in, in a given field, and maybe we're swinging 15 different manufacturers of machines. But you know what? At the end of the, for all of that, when we're all standing around looking at everybody's finds, it doesn't matter what brand we're wearing or what brand we're swinging. We're all out there trying to have fun and enjoy ourselves and rescue pieces of the past. That's right. And for most beginners, and myself included, finding a detector that's easy to learn and user-friendly for your first detector is probably more important than a lot of other considerations. Absolutely, because less frustration is is definitely going to keep you in the hobby longer. I mean, it, people well, coming into the hobby, they, they get a machine that maybe is overwhelming to them. They, they can't find the books or the resources of the people or groups to help them. 
the frustration sets in early, it sets in heavy and hard, and next thing you know, they're like, oh, I just, this isn't for me, I give up. There's already plenty of ed- plenty of frustration in the hobby built into it without adding that additional frustration. Right. Yeah, because you know, I, like, I guarantee like, you it's not a deep, dark secret. We're all out there digging trash. <laughs> yes, from, from digging the trash to seeing Josh Kimball dig a silver half, you know, it can be very frustrating to the beginner. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, I uh I can remember a couple of years ago I had uh somebody that was getting into the hobby bought their machine from from another dealer and and they had actually told him said, "Oh, you're in Josh's neck of the woods. You should look him up and uh maybe he can show you the ropes." And I had told him we got together and talked and and discussed a place that we could meet up good neutral ground and and do some hunting. And I told him, I said, now, you know, don't forget everything that you've seen on TV and the commercials and everything. I said, we'd we'd all love to go out there and pop a diamond ring every time we go out. And that's what the advertising is geared for, because the manufacturer wants you to buy their product. But in all reality, it doesn't happen like that for all of us. And... We go out to hunt, and I'll bet I had the machine on for 30 seconds and hit a target and cut my plug and said, well, I'll be, how about that? That's that's a little surprising. He says, what? And I pulled out a 10-carat diamond ring. And I told him, I said, honestly, you know, it doesn't happen <laughs> this easy. It doesn't happen like this every time. You know, everything I told you still stands. And yeah. it, it just, <laughs> unfortunately, that day, to the perspective of a newcomer, I made it look so easy. It's like, yeah, there's nothing to it. We just go out and do this. But I, I had to explain to him, you don't realize how many pull tabs that we will dig before we hit that nice gold ring. You're gonna dig trash. You're gonna get frustrated. <laughs> uh, I got to the point where uh, every once in a while, I have a favorite pull tab I dig. <laughs> right. I, I, I can I can go out in a, a field where you can walk for, you know, dozens of feet, and not find a target. And I'll find I'll find a pull tab out in the middle of that field. Uh, it just it never seems to fail. But I know when I just tell myself, hey, if I'm digging that pull tab, I'm digging the right thing if I want to find gold. There you go. Exactly. You're digging in the right range. And one of these times, that signal's going to be a nice ring and not a pull tab. I'd like to do some beach hunting and have a chance to really find a a, a ring with a cluster of diamonds uh, to buy me some new knees. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, very good point. That's a that's just a dream, you know. But I I have a distinction of my largest coin I found was a uh, gold double eagle copy. <laughs> yeah, that I seen that when you made that post, and it's like. Ouch, that hurts. I mean, it, it's cool. Don't it get me wrong. Me. It is cool. But... It, 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 yeah. You uh, just, it is unique. You don't find those every day. I mean, it is a, it's right. a once-in-a-lifetime type of find. But it didn't... People said, oh, you must have been really disappointed or this that. I've learned from experience that you listen to the tone... And the tone told me that it was not gold. Exactly. And I do that myself a lot of times in the field, too. Uh, You know, if if somebody brings up a ring to me and says, what do you think about this? I'll throw it down and run my coil over it and go, well, it looks nice, but it's not what you think it is. It's not ringing up right for what you think it could be. I actually got excited when I found out what it was because I thought I'd found uh, a large modern token. 
And I oh, was yeah. happy with that. I was happy with that. I was going, I love finding tokens and I don't care what so age do they I. are. I even if they're Chuck E. Cheese, I don't care. I love finding tokens. So, uh, when I found out it was this, uh, gold copy, I realized, hey, this is even neater. That's really cool. Exactly. It's all in your perspective. I like it when those oddball sort of oddity finds pop up, too, just because of the simple fact that they are so unique. And I found it near a school, probably one of the heaviest, most heavily hunted schools in the area. It, I, I wasn't expecting to find much more than clad or maybe some recently lost jewelry at best. Right. So... So it was a real shocker for me to find, you know, of a find for me. And Absolutely. I, it, it, it made my hunt. It really did. I can see that. It would have been the same for me. Definitely. And if I'd been hunting a place, that only places I researched and things, I would have missed that. I would have missed the opportunity to make that find. But not everybody has the time or the patience or the inclination, you know, to hunt like that. It, it doesn't bother me. People, pe- you know, you notice something, uh, uh, Josh, I bet, like a lot of the people online, uh, when you have a honey hole and you're posting your finds, suddenly you get people coming out of the woodwork saying, oh, I- I'd love to find something like that. Could you take me hunting with you? Uh, me. I ask people to take me to a place that where it has been very productive, but they consider hunted out because I'm looking for the next challenge for me exactly. to improve my detecting. And I don't mind going someplace where somebody has had a really good detector and they feel like the place is hunted out. Uh, I, I like the chance to do that, but I'm, I'm a bit of a masochist, I think. <laughs> well, and and you can have the best equipment that there is out there on the market, and if you don't understand what that machine is telling you, someone else could come along with what could perceivably be an inferior machine, but they know what that machine is telling them and just work circles around you. Because it, it still boils down to how well you know your machine. Right. I, I've i been told some things about my hunting compared to someone else hunt using this brand of machine that I would knock the pants off them. And I won't even mention the brand because I'll get some people out there irate with me. You know. <laughs> uh, but I, one, I just noticed from my own posting from the beginning. In the beginning, uh, people find out you know, always say, oh, yeah, you find something nice, and they'll ask you, what detector you use? And I tell them, oh, I'm using this bounty hunter. And they say, oh, you know, it's like they're disappointed, you know. Right. And I I even had a few remarks early on, like uh, uh, people saying, oh, you use a bounty hunter. Why don't you get something other than a toy to detect with? Hey, you know, if if it works for you and it's not broke, don't fix it. I mean, I I have a, a friend of mine that we had hunted together for years, and he used a bounty hunter that, well, quite frankly, it was kind of like the ghetto. I, it, it was missing knobs and buttons, and it had been torn apart a few times to drain water out of it. But somehow or another, the thing still worked for him, and he still did very well with it. And I'm thoroughly convinced he knew that he, well, he knows that machine so well, if it would ever completely die on him, I don't think he'd even upgrade. I think he'd go right back out and do what he could to find that same exact model bounty hunter because he was just hell on wheels with it. (laughs) Uh, I can understand that with anyone and the detective they use. If they have success, you know, that's where they had the most enjoyment when they had the most success. So right. I, I can understand that attitude. I just, 
I can't, I just try to keep an open mind. I have a technical background that helps. So I can go and read the spec sheets from detectors. I can even, if I can find some, uh, a copy of it online, I can even go and read the blueprints for the circuitry. Right. So I, I can make a little bit different determination about detectors than other people can. But the people that actually have it, the detector in their hands have a totally different perspective. But I also listen to, uh, and I found, I found that over the years as I, as people have seen more and more of my posts, the com, the disparaging comments about bounty hunter have become very few and far between. Um, I don't know if it's because they think I'm a real SOB and going to give them heck. <laughs> Or what? But uh, I'm hopeful that it's it's the things I find. <laughs> right there, you go. There you go. Uh, uh, probably it's a little bit of both. <laughs> 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 well, you know, hey, it, it, sometimes that's just the way it is. I am what I am. Exactly. Me and Popeye. There you go. Well, all right, I'm going to get out of here so I can let you go. Great all show. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I wasn't expecting you to be online. Well, uh, it's Wednesday. Oh, I I, I was thinking that t- today was the day you went to the. No, the no, retreat. that that's the thirteenth. I'm premature. <laughs> like I used to be when I was a a young man. At any rate, that's a different story. There you have go. a good evening and have a great night, folks. I'm signing off. Thanks good for night. the call, Mike. Well, so we've had some some quite uh, very good calls from Chuck and Mike both, and some outstanding interaction in the chat. We. Uh, we did kind of uh, run on a little long tonight, so we appreciate everyone for hanging in there with us. If you enjoyed the show, make sure and throw us a like. You can follow us here on Spreaker, iHeart, iTunes, uh, Ohio Metal Detecting on YouTube, Facebook. We're we're out there in all sorts of places. And don't forget, tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern, check out Detect America. They will be discussing the Vanquish. Should be interesting to hear. I'll be there, and I will see some of you there as well. Until the next time, get out there, try to find something if you can, post up those photos, you know how we love to see them. Have a wonderful evening, folks. <laughs>